What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT. If you're new and you haven't already, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. We're available on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from. You can find the JT Sports Podcast. Leave a like, subscribe to the channel. On this episode, we're going to be talking some college football. I know it's been a while. We had to cover the NFL draft and NFL for agency, but we're back talking college ball. I'm going to be explaining to you guys why I think Florida State is ready to make a statement this upcoming season. The Texas Longhorns, it seems like every offseason, they get a lot of attention. They have high expectations. You always have people shouting on rooftops saying, Texas football is going to be back this year. And then the season rolls around and they're not able to live up to expectations. But this season, I think things are going to be different. For the first time in a very long time, I think that Texas is actually going to be able to live up to the hype. I'm also going to be talking to you guys about why I think Texas A&M is going to bounce back this season. They went 5-7 and seven in 2022. It was a really disappointing year, but I think they're going to bounce back in a major way. Let's start off talking about Florida State, man. FSU under Mike Norvell has come a very long way. And prior to last season, things were looking really gloomy. In the city of Tallahassee. They lost to Jacksonville State a couple of years ago. I still remember that game like it was yesterday. And they didn't get cheated by the refs. Jacksonville State, an FCS opponent, beat Florida State at home, fair and square. And then after Jacksonville State won, you know what they did? They went into the middle of Dole Campbell Stadium. And they planted their flag in the middle of Florida State's field. And then everybody was starting to question Mike Norvell. They was like, oh my goodness, we whiffed on hiring Mike Norvell. We got to move on from him. And last season, around this time, I came on here and said that I expected Florida State to win at least eight games or more. And surprisingly, a lot of Florida State fans did not share my optimism. And the reason why I was so surprised is because I'm a Miami Hurricane fan. I know, I know. You guys probably like, JT, what the hell are you doing talking about the Florida State Seminoles and you're a Hurricane fan? Chill out, man. First of all, I'm not biased, okay? And second of all, I bet my homeboy $100 that FSU is going to win at least eight games or more in 2022. And he happens to be a Florida Gator fan. And he was saying, man, Florida State ain't even going to make it to a bowl game. Mark Novella ain't a good coach. Jordan Travis, he isn't going to improve as a passer. And I told him, okay, bro, I think you're being a little bit biased because you're a Gator fan. But watch Florida State win eight games. And what did Florida State do? They didn't win just eight games. They won 10 games. And for Florida State, man, I think that this is the best team in the ACC going into the upcoming college football season. You may be like, man, JT, what about Clemson? You remember what Ric Flair used to say? To be the man, you have to beat the man. And that is true, but trust me, I believe it's coming. Clemson, they beat FSU last year, but I have a really strong feeling that Florida State is going to knock off Clemson this year. This is probably the most talented Florida State team that we've seen in a very long time. And coming from a Miami Hurricane fan, I'm going to keep it 100 with y'all boys. I'm a little jealous. I mean, this FSU team, y'all looking nice. Y'all, y'all looking nice. You got Jordan Travis coming back. He was pro football focused, highest graded quarterback in all of college football last year. He's expected to be a contender for the Heisman Trophy. He had 31 total touchdowns last season. The dude has improved tremendously. I remember there was one point, every time Jordan Travis used to come into a game, you knew he was just going to run the football. His passing ability at one point kind of seemed like it was non-existent. So the growth of Jordan Travis over the last couple of years under Mike Norvell and the staff has been really impressive. 
This dude had career highs in pretty much every statistical category throwing the football. Completed 64% of his passes. He threw 24 touchdowns, only had five interceptions. He threw for 3,214 passing yards. And we already know how dynamic he is when he decides to tuck the football and run. But the player who I'm the most excited to watch on FSU this year is 6'7", 235-pound wide receiver Johnny Wilson. Now, I don't know why the hell Arizona State let this guy walk away and transfer, but this was a tremendous fine for FSU. Now, I don't know where Johnny Wilson is from, but whatever they was feeding this dude when he was a baby, man, they might... They might need to check him for something. He might need to go ahead and get drug tested because I can never remember the last time we've seen a wide receiver that was 6'7", 235 pounds. And this guy is damn near unstoppable. He was second in college football last year and yards per reception. And he's only going to get better. Like, how do you defend this if you're a cornerback? Most cornerbacks... And today's age of football, probably a what, 5'10", 5'11"? And then at best, you may find a cornerback that's 6'2", 6'3", maybe 6'4". But even then, Johnny Wilson is taller than pretty much every single defensive back he's matched up against. The dude doesn't really have to do too much to catch a 50-50 ball over you. And plus, he's a physical specimen. And he's also really athletic. I don't know... How the hell a team like Clemson is going to have an answer for Johnny Wilson? I expect Johnny Wilson to have a big season for the Florida State Seminoles this year. And I'm definitely not going to be surprised if he ends up being a first-round pick in next year's NFL Draft. Heck, he probably could be a top-15 pick. A 6'7", 235-pound wide receiver. Where do you find this at? Just where? Are there any other wide receivers and college football right now that have Johnny Wilson size. I mean, oh my goodness. And then you got running back, Trey Benson coming back. He had nine touchdowns. He was averaging over six yards per carry. And he's going to be running behind probably the best offensive line that FSU has had in recent memory. I remember where, I remember a time when the offensive line for Florida State used to be a huge concern. And even last year, you were just hoping that if you were a Seminoles fan, that the offensive line would at least be average. And the offensive line was probably one of the best in the ACC. And going into this year, with the offensive line that you bring back, with well, the offensive linemen that you have returning, and the guys who you're bringing in from the transfer portal, this offensive line is probably going to be the best in the ACC. And another guy who I'm really excited to watch Another find who they got out of the transfer portal is former South Carolina tight end Jaheim Bell. Now, you guys know I'm a huge fan of Jaheim Bell, and I watched a lot of him when he was at South Carolina. And when I tell you that this dude can do everything, that's not just a, I'm not just saying that just to say that this dude literally can do everything. At South Carolina, I watched this dude play Wildcat quarterback, line up at H back tight end he probably can't line up at wide receiver like you have a versatile chess piece that you pretty much can line up on any part of your offense and he's going to be a mismatch for whoever's defending them and this guy is one of the most athletic tight ends in all of college football he's up there athletically with Brock Bowers and then you also were able to to get one of the best cornerbacks in this transfer portal cycle. And Fentrell Cypress, who transfers from the University of Virginia. He's going to be a big boost that secondary. And this is a defense that returns 94% of the production that they had from last year. This FSU team, man, I think they're legit this year. And I think they're going to make a statement this season. You know, we always ask... When is Miami going to be back? When is Texas going to be back? We need to be asking ourselves, is Florida State going to return to the ranks of the college football elite? Because it it sure looks like it right now. And if you're a Clemson fan, I know you still have your chest poked out because FSU still hasn't beaten you yet. 
and hasn't taken the title away from you as the kings of the ACC. But trust me, it's coming. And the thing that FSU is doing that Dabo Sweeney refuses to do is utilizing the transfer portal. Now, he went out and he got Garrett Riley. But what's the use of getting an offensive coordinator if you're not going to give him the necessary pieces needed for him to execute his offense at a high level? I mean, right now, FSU, in my opinion, not only is the best team in the ACC, but I'm picking them to win the ACC. And remind you, I'm a Miami Hurricane fan, okay? And I've won a lot of money betting on Florida State football. Now, I'm never going to put my money on Miami, not, not until they prove to me that they're capable of not losing to a Middle Tennessee State and actually showing me that they can actually play like, you know, they're actually a Power 5 football program or, you know, a legit blue blood program, which a lot of Miami fans be quick to tell you about the history, quick to tell you about what they won in the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s. But what the hell have they won in the last decade? Absolutely nothing. So for Florida State, man, you're in a very good position to grab the ACC conference by the throat. And when you play Clemson, look, when you played Clemson last season, okay, Clemson pretty much had to be. Clemson pretty much was the more talented football team. But now you've caught up to Clemson. All right, Clemson has gotten too complacent. They got too comfortable. You want to know why Clemson got so comfortable? Because the ACC for the last couple of years has pretty much been a joke. And these Florida schools have not been able to get their act right. Miami still can't get it right, even with Mario Cristobal. But FSU, they're cracking the code. And last season, you can say, well, JT, Florida State didn't have the toughest schedule. Okay, cool. But, I mean, they still won 10 games. That's something. What did they do the season before that? They weren't all that great. They were losing to Jacksonville State. Remember that. Remember how far... FSU has come. They've went from losing to Jacksonville State to being pretty much my favorite to win the ACC. And even Vegas kind of has Florida State as a favorite to win the ACC. And the reason why I say kind is because it kind of keeps fluctuating. One day, some odds makers will have Florida State as the favorite to win the ACC and then you wake up the next morning and all of a sudden Clemson's the favorite to win the ACC. But when you look at this Florida State roster going into this season, I don't know how you can't be excited if you're a Knowles fan because this is one of the most talented Florida State teams that we've seen in a very long time. And I believe they can do some damage this year. You got Iz Rusher, Jared Verse coming back. He could have been a first round pick in this past year's draft, but he decided to come back and now he's getting talked about going potentially in the top 10 of the 2024 NFL draft. You have defensive tackle Fabian Lovett, one of the better interior defensive linemen in the nation. Your linebacker core is really good, and your secondary is going to be really good. Also, like this Florida State team going into this year, honestly, pretty much has no flaws or no considerable holes to worry about. This offensive line is going to be the best it's been in years. You have a star quarterback in Jordan Travis. Like These were all things that we were questioning going into 2022. And a year later, all these things are strengths. And they had the sixth best transfer portal class according to 24-7 Sports. And they returned the majority of their best players from last season now they had a couple of guys who ended up graduating and leaving for the NFL draft but for the most part this is pretty much the same team from last year now they play LSU week one and that's going to be a really big game because LSU is pretty much in a similar situation that Florida State's in right now they took everybody by surprise last year with how good they were year one under Brian Kelly making it to the SEC championship game. They have a lot of momentum going into this upcoming season. And they're also a team who's also looking to get back to the ranks of the college football league. And then you got to play Clemson 
on the road. And that pretty much is going to be the game that's going to tell us everything that we need to know about where Florida State is as a program. Because we're going to judge how successful Florida State is this season, largely based on if they're going to be able to beat Clemson and if they're going to be able to win the ACC. And right now, if I was a betting man, I would have all my money on the Florida State Seminoles winning the ACC. And I have no problem saying that being the Miami Hurricane fan. As a matter of fact, I have a strong feeling that y'all probably going to beat us. Okay, and you know, I I hope that Miami ends up smacking y'all. You get what I'm saying? Like, I'm rooting for y'all, but I'm not rooting for y'all when y'all play the Miami Hurricanes. But I'm going to be watching you guys very closely this year. You want to know why? Because I'm going to be right across the street from y'all boys. I'm going to be transferring the fam. You, I'm going to be in the hill. So I'm going to stop by, catch me a couple Seminole games. And if you guys spot me at Doe Campbell Stadium, you know, say what's up. You know, maybe take a picture with me or something like that. I love engaging with y'all. But for the state, man, y'all done came a long way. Y'all went from having a school called Jacksonville State planting their flag in the middle of y'all stadium to now being talked about not only winning the ACC, but potentially making it to the college football playoffs. Do you know the last time we saw Florida State playing the college football playoffs? It was the first time it was introduced when they lost to Oregon. That's how long it's been since FSU has been in the national spotlight. And everybody I know is already hopping on the FSU bandwagon. But just remember, we kind of already saw this coming last year. Florida State, man, these boys look like they're about to put the college football world on notice. And they're about to let everybody know that the Florida State Seminoles are back. And I think that this is going to be their statement year. They have a lot of talent returning. You bring in even more talent through the transfer portal. And with Clemson, their inability to develop offensive linemen and to get better receivers, I think that's going to hurt them. And after FSU gets them smacking Clemson around this year, I think Dabo Sweeney's going to get a dose of reality. And I think he's going to end up getting humbled a little bit. And once that happens, I think you're going to start seeing Dabo Sweeney and Clemson utilizing the transfer portal because eventually they're going to get tired of getting smacked around by FSU and they're going to have to find a way to come out with a counterpunch. And that counterpunch is going to be Dabo Sweeney swallowing his pride, gulp, and hitting that transfer portal. As a matter of fact, I think it, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to call it ignorant, but I do think that it's a little bit you know, puzzling that Dabo Sweeney refuses to add talent in the transfer portal when you see what FSU is doing, okay? And if you were to ask Dabo Sweeney right now how he feels about FSU, he'll probably be like, you know, they're doing some good things, but you know, they still got to beat us. That's coming. Trust me, okay? Florida State, these boys, they're going to be something serious this year. I promise you, I promise you this isn't the same FSU team that you remember under Willie Taggart or in the last final days of Jimbo Fisher. This is a Florida State football program that right now is in prime position to not only grab this conference by the throat and dethrone Clemson, but also getting back to the college football playoffs and getting back to that national championship team. Another team that I think could also get back into the ranks of the college football elite this year are the Texas Longhorns. Now, I already know what you guys are going to say, JT, here you go. Here you go. You're just like everybody else gassing up Texas. And you already know what they do every single year. People shout on their rooftops. Texas is going to be back. And then Texas ends up disappointing. And here's the thing, right? You know, I think that people are a little bit unfair when it comes to how they view Texas football. Okay, because year one under Steve Sarkeesian, they went five and seven and everybody clowned them. All right, even though we knew that year one probably is going to be a rough year. Now, give it when you're at the University of Texas, you should at least be able to win a ball game no matter what. But okay, five and seven. 
So what is he doing year two? They go eight and five. And then all of a sudden, oh, last year was a disappointing season. Like, how was last year a disappointing season? The year before, they didn't even make it to a freaking bowl game. Year two, they win eight games. That's improvement. That's growth. You know, like, Texas is the equivalent to the Dallas Cowboys. You know, the Dallas Cowboys, they always get a lot of flack because they're not able to get it done. Okay, they had a lot of shortcomings in the postseason in the past. But guess what? History doesn't dictate future outcomes. That's why they play the game, people. Last year, Alabama got lucky that Quinn Ewers got injured. Because if Quinn Ewers would have played that whole game, boy, Texas would have been in Alabama. And I know we can't go off what else, but be honest, man. Quinn Ewers was balling out against Alabama. He had this one throw really early in the game um, on the right sideline. Beautiful throw. I forgot who he threw it to, but it had me going crazy. And you got people saying Quinn Ewers is overrated, bro. Quinn Ewers was playing in his first season. Not just that, but Texas, for the most part, had a fairly young team. So I don't really get how people keep saying last year's Texas team was overhyped. I think that last year's Texas team kind of met expectations. I mean, you're expecting a team that's starting a good amount of freshman offensive linemen and a good amount of young players on both sides of the football to be able to compete for a championship. I mean, come on. Some of you guys are a little bit unfair when it comes to how you talk about Texas football. Listen, I get it. This is a team that you kind of get tired of hearing about being good every single year and not living up to it. But if there was a year for Texas to actually live up to the hype, this is it. This is one of the most talented rosters that we've seen Texas have in a very long time. And Urban Meyer on a podcast that he does for On3 literally came out and said that he thinks this is the most talented roster in all of college football. Now, I still think that Georgia has the most talented roster in college football. Then I'll have Ohio State behind them. And then I'll probably have Texas somewhere in the top three, maybe top five. You probably could switch them around with a couple of teams. But this Texas team is absolutely stacked. Did you see Quinn Ewers in the spring game? Quinn Ewers looked like a completely different quarterback. And he wasn't bad last season. I thought he was pretty solid. I think the problem with Quinn Ewers was that he was too inconsistent. He was too erratic. His accuracy at times wasn't that great. His decision making sometimes made you go, bro, why would you throw that there? Did you not see bro there? But I think Quinn Ewers is going to be in for a breakout season. And not only is he going to take a big leap, but this offensive line is going to take a big leap. I don't know if you guys know this, but their offensive line class from their 2022 recruiting cycle, according to ESPN, was the best in college football. I think their offensive line coach won Big 12 Recruiter of the Year, if I'm not mistaken. So this offensive line should be really good this year. The wide receiver room is one of the best in the nation. You got Xavier Worthy, who probably is the second best wide receiver in college football behind Marvin Harrison. You got Isaiah Nayer, transferred from Wyoming. Some of you guys may not know of him because he hasn't sued up in an official game for the Longhorns because last year he got injured before the season started. But this year he's going to be healthy and he's going to add to the talent that they have at wide receiver. They got Georgia transfer A.D. Mitchell. You got Jordan Winnington who returns. Like this receiving core is absolutely stacked. Now, I know they lost B. John Robinson. And that is going to be a pretty significant loss. But I think that Jonathan Brooks, Jaden Blue, they're going to be able to get the job done now. Are they going to be able to match the production and the talent of B. John Robinson? Probably not, but I don't think they're going to be too far of a drop off especially with the offensive line improving. But this defense should be really good. Now, the secondary, you know, I think the secondary has talent. They got a mixture of some young guys in there who are going to compete for a significant playing time. And they're also are going to have some veterans who are going to return. I really think that the strength of this Texas defense is on the interior of the defensive line. Okay, now... 
I still have questions about how good is the pass rush going to be, especially when you're playing in the pass-heavy Big 12 conference. You got to be able to get after the quarterback. And when you're able to get after the quarterback, that's going to lead to you having more success on third down. They also added Arkansas, well, former Arkansas safety, Jalen Catalan. He was one of the best safeties in the whole entire nation last season, even though he didn't really play, but he was talked about being one of the best in college football. He just wasn't able to stay healthy, so he's going to come to Texas, and I think that he's going to have a pretty big impact on this defense. This was somebody who was voted as a team captain for Arkansas. He was regarded as one of the best in his position in that conference, so him going to Texas is going to be a major boost to this secondary, and plus, When you look at a Big 12 conference, I mean, how is it crazy to say that Texas is going to win it? Okay, now I know that games and the outcome of games are not determined by paper. Okay, there's still a reason why the games are played. But at the same time, right now, if you had to bet your money on who is going to win the Big 12, be honest, bro. You probably would be putting your money on Texas because from a talent standpoint, I don't really think there's any team in the Big 12 this year who comes remotely close to being as good from a talent standpoint as Texas. TCU lost a lot of talent from last year's team. Baylor, I don't really know how they're going to look this year. Texas Tech, I think they're on the up and up, but I don't think they're ready to compete with Texas yet. Okay, I think that if you were betting on this thing right now, your real hard-earned money that you work for, that you grind blood, sweat, and tears for, you probably will be putting your money on the long corners. And I think it's kind of stupid how, you know, people try to judge how good a team's going to be based on what they do in the past. Every team is different every single year. Football is a year-to-year sport. No team is the same every single year. Some teams may still be good, but they're not going to be good the same way they were the year prior because college football, the transfer portal, you always got guys hitting that thing 24-7. You always got guys declaring for the draft. You got guys who end up getting injured. Like The rosters are always so different. There's always so much roster turnover in college football that it's kind of dumb to judge a team based on history. Like, bro, why are you talking about what Texas did during the Charlie Strong era? Like, bro, that was so long ago. Why are you talking about what they did under Tom Herman? Newsflash, people, Charlie Strong and Tom Herman are not the head coach of Texas. Steve Sharkeesian is. I don't don't know, bro. Like, do you guys think people kind of hate Texas? Be honest, bro, because, I mean, I'm a diehard college football fan, and even I kind of be like, okay, well, I, I get why people get upset about the Texas hype and all that. But it's like, dang, like some of you guys just don't want to give Texas a chance. Some of you guys are just so blinded by what they've done in the past that you're kind of overlooking how talented this roster is. And it kind of messes up how you contextualize last season. If you thought that Texas was going to make it to the college football playoffs last year, your expectations were misplaced. Okay, now, if you're a Longhorns fan, you can say, man, JT, this is the University of Texas. We got so much money. We bring in good recruiting classes every single year. Like, we got a right to expect the championship every single year. And I understand that. But at the same time, when's the last time you won a championship? When's the last time you even played in like a big time ball game? You get what I'm saying? It's like you kind of got to change the expectations a little bit. But this season, I definitely think that the hype is warranted. All right. I don't think Urban Meyer was was drunk or he was high off that gas or he was off that flock when he said that Texas had one of the best rosters in college football. Like you look at his roster, top to bottom, it's really good, especially when you look at the talent that they have at wide receiver. I expect Quinn Ewers to take a major leap this year, all right? This was somebody who was going into last season really inexperienced. The guy didn't even play his final season in high school, all right? So it's like, what were you expecting out of Texas last year? They had 
a fairly young team. When you have a young team, you're going to have growing pains. You're going to have some games that you lose that you kind of have no business losing. And you're also going to be in some games that nobody expects you to be. And if you were to tell me that Texas was going to take Alabama to the wire, I would have said you're tripping. Honestly, like, Texas fans, be, be real with me. Did you think that game with Alabama was going to be as close as what it was? And keep it 100. Don't lie. Keep it 100. I'm pretty sure most of you guys are going to say, no, we didn't. Now you play Alabama again this year, but you got to play them on the road in Tuscaloosa. And we know how hard it is to beat Alabama on the road in Tuscaloosa. They barely losing that thing. But if Texas beats Alabama, is your perception on them going to change? Be honest, if Texas goes on the road this year and they beat Alabama, don't act like it's not going to open your eyes. Be honest. Now, you can say, man, it's Texas, bro. Even if they beat Alabama, eventually they're going to crash back down. Okay, I, I still think you're a little bit of a hater, but okay, I can understand that. But boy, if they beat Alabama, everybody's going to be talking about it. And don't act like you ain't going to be close to hopping on that hype train. But Texas this year, man, they definitely have all of the pieces to live up to the high expectations that people have in place for them. Will Texas win the Big 12? I'm pretty sure they will. I don't really think there's a team in this conference that even comes close to Texas from a talent standpoint. Now, while we're on... Texas, let's talk about another team in the state of Texas, Texas A&M. Now, Texas A&M fans, y'all up. I got to make sure y'all up in there because normally every offseason, y'all be talking a lot of noise about, man, this is the year, man. We dark horse college football playoff contenders every single season. Like, we, we get mad at Texas fans every offseason for screaming, Texas is going to be back. The Longhorns are going to be back. But yet, why we don't keep this same energy with Texas and them fans? Because for the last couple of years, I've been hearing a lot of talk about how Texas and them is going to be a dark horse college football playoff contender and how it's finally going to be the year they get in. They finally break through. Well, last year happened, and boy... Shit hit the fan, boy, real fast. Like, real fast. They lost to Appalachian State. Yeah, I ain't forget about that. Y'all paid Appalachian State $1.5 million to kick y'all butt. And not only that, they kind of dominated y'all. Now, I don't care what the final box score says. If you watch that game, you would know that Appalachian State kind of gave it to Texas a and Like, they only had two offensive possessions in that whole entire game inside of Appalachian State territory. Go back and watch that game. I, I promise to you. And then they kind of bounced back. They beat Miami. They got out to a 3-1 start. But after they got out to a 3-1 start, ooh, things got ugly. Boy, they lost six straight. Haynes King wasn't good. Max Johnson got injured. And then my guy, Connor Wigman, came in. And I thought he did a pretty good job as a true freshman last season. Now, his worst game was against Auburn. I ain't going to hold you like against Auburn. He, he didn't look good. But with the hiring of offensive coordinator Bobby Petrino, I think that Connor Wigman is going to end up becoming one of the best quarterbacks in college football this year. And... Honestly, a large reason why I believe Texas A&M is going to bounce back this season is because of the hiring of Barbara Petrino. Now, I know it's been a lot of debate and discussion about who's going to be calling the plays, him or Jimbo, but I expect Bobby Petrino to be calling the plays because he originally was supposed to be the OC for Barry Odom at UNLV. And then Jimbo Fisher says, hey, bro, like, you want to come be the offensive coordinator for me? He says, oh, sure. So he pretty much walks in and walks out of UNLV and comes straight to Texas A&M to be the OC for Jimbo Fisher. So I'm pretty sure Bobby Petrino would have never left UNLV if he was going to come to Texas A&M and not call the plays. And you can make it about money all you want to, bro. Like, at the end of the day, bro, 
Bobby Petrino just isn't a random OC. This isn't a young OC. This isn't somebody who's trying to prove himself. This is one of the most accomplished offensive-minded coaches in the sport right now. All right, now you can say he may be a little washed up, but I'm not going to overlook his track record. I remember what he did at Louisville with Lamar Jackson. All right, I still remember Ryan Mallett. Yeah, how many of y'all remember Ryan Mallett? Arkansas legend Ryan Mallett. Yeah, he had that. He had them boys rolling. He had them boys cooking. I think this offense, with Bobby Petrino calling the plays, is going to be the most explosive offense that we've seen out of Texas A&M in a very long time. Like, Jimbo Fisher, yes, he is an overrated head coach, but I don't think he's a crappy head coach. I just think that eventually... You get to a point where the game kind of starts to pass you by. And eventually, you kind of lose a little bit of your touch. And people used to always call Jimbo Fisher the quarterback whisperer. And I used to always say, like, man, when's the last time, like, Jimbo Fisher produced a superstar-level quarterback? And last season, when I said that, like, Texas A&M was like, well, you need a superstar quarterback to be good. Like, duh. But it's not like you just get one handed to you. You got to develop that. That's the job of a coach to develop players and put players in the proper situation to succeed. And Jimbo Fisher's offense hasn't really done a great job of that when it comes to quarterbacks. The last great quarterback Jimbo Fisher had was Jameis Winston. Kellen Mond was good, but he was nowhere close to the level of Jameis Winston. And there's a lot of reasons that people point to to why Jimbo Fisher's offense has kind of lost its touch over the last couple of years. Some people say it's a little bit too complicated. Some people say it's too conservative with all the doggone bubble screens and stuff like that. But as long as Jimbo Fisher can keep his hands off the offensive play calling and he let Bobby Petrino do his thing up there in the press box, I think this thing is going to work. Now, Jimbo Fisher ends up calling the plays, and Bobby Petrino doesn't end up calling the plays at all, then I take back everything that I'm saying about Texas A&M right now. Okay, because I'm going to just keep it a stack with you. I don't have any confidence in Texas A&M if Jimbo Fisher is the one calling the plays. All right, Bobby Petrino is one of the best play callers in college football in, what, the past decade? I mean, like, every coach has some bad play calling here and there. But for the most part, I think Bobby Petrino is pretty reliable. And I don't think that Jimbo Fisher will go out and hire an OC that has over 50 years of experience not to allow him to call plays. I just think that would be kind of dumb. And I just kind of think that would be an egotistical move that ends up resulting in head coaches getting fired. And I'm pretty sure Jimbo Fisher wants to remain the head coach of Texas A&M. Even though if he gets fired, he's still going to get paid regardless. But, you know, I think Jimbo Fisher wants to stay in Texas A&M. I think he wants to stay in Aggieland. All right, now, word on the street, and this is a word on the street, a lot of Texas A&M fans say that Jimbo Fisher was kind of giving an ultimatum. Now, once again, I'm going to say this is a rumor. Some people say that the the upper ups above Jimbo Fisher, the people who cut his check kind of said, hey, bro, like you better hire an offensive coordinator unless you want to get that pink slip. So he ended up going ahead and getting one of the most experienced offensive coordinators he can get. And when you look at the talent that Texas A&M has on offense, I mean, they're loaded. Their wide receiver room is pretty good. Their top three receivers from last year all returned. Evan Stewart, Moose Muhammad, Anaya Smith. You had Noah Thomas, who had a fantastic spring. He should be in for a breakout season. He was a four-star receiver coming out of that 2022 recruiting cycle. This dude is 6'5", 195 pounds. With the arm that Connor Wigman has, this dude should be a really big part of generating the explosive plays in the past game. And that's the thing that you're looking for if you're an AM fan. Like, over the last two seasons, you struggled to generate big plays. Like, I think you've ranked near the bottom of college football and passing plays or explosive plays for more than 20 yards. So for Bart Petrino, you're going to give him a really good receiver room to work with. We already know they lost Devin A-Chain, who pretty much was 
one of the best things to watch about Texas A&M last season other than the defense. But Texas A&M does a pretty good job recruiting the running back position. So I don't think it's going to be a huge drop off there. Now this defense, I'm not really concerned about the defense. Yes, I know that their run defense wasn't good and they did struggle to get pressure on the quarterback. But I expect both of those things to improve. When I look at Texas A&M's run defense, I think it was more so like poor execution, guys not filling the holes, guys not really filling those gaps. I think this season, that should improve. The linebacker unit should improve. And when you look at this secondary, I mean, everybody talks about how talented Alabama secondary is going into this year. Texas A&M secondary, I think is almost as good. And I do say almost, I'm not going to say as good because Alabama has some has some dogs in their secondary, but I don't think Texas A&M is too far off. You got Tyreek Chappelle, you have Tony Grimes transfer from UNC, you got a really good group of safeties, your defensive line, you got Shamar Turner, Walter Nolan, I mean this is... A really good defense. My only concern really is the linebacker unit. I'm not really worried about the defense. Like, their defense last year could have been a lot better if their offense wasn't going three and out or wasn't having costly turnovers and just was inefficient. Like, a lot of people tend to forget this, but the key to having success on defense is by having an offense that complements you. If your offense is constantly turning the football over, putting you in bad field position, or going three and out, like imagine being a defensive tackle, right? You get you get a stop, right? After you know uh what a eight to nine play drive, and you finally get a team to punt the ball, and then you you just get done getting a sip of that Gatorade, and all of a sudden you got to go right back on the field because your offense just went three and out after you just got a stop. So imagine that. Of course, your defense is going to end up not being as good as what it possibly could be because they're going to be on the field for more plays than what they should be. I I think that's kind of common sense. I think we can all agree with that, right? So with the offense improving, the defense should improve because the defense isn't going to be on the field as much unless they're running like a Tennessee kind of offense, which I doubt that's going to happen. But for the most part, this defense, I think is going to be really good. And as long as Bobby Petrino is able to do his thing and Jimbo Fisher isn't meddling and lets the dude call the plays, I think that Texas A&M is going to bounce back. I really love Connor Wigman. Like, when I watch him, he kind of reminds me of Dak Prescott, but with a way stronger arm. I mean, in that Texas A&M spring game, I know it's a spring game, but Connor Wigman was making some really nice throws. And some really NFL level throws. Like he was making throws in the tight windows. I was really impressed with what I saw out of Connor Wigman. Not just in the spring game, but in a few games that he started in last year. I think that this guy has a lot of potential. But Texas A&M, if Bobby Petrino is able to, you know, call the plays and run the offense with little to no interference with Jimbo Fisher, I think Texas A&M should be able to win. Seven to ten games this season. Now, last year, I didn't even have Texas A&M making it to a bowl game. Just keeping the stack. Now, a little bit of that was me wanting to stick it to some of you Texas A&M fans because some of you Texas A&M fans kind of blow me. Like, I'm just keeping it being like, it was one person I was going back and forth talking about some, you don't know nothing about football. Like, Jimbo Fisher hasn't had this. He hasn't had that. Like, bro, he is a head coach. He recruits these guys. And now we got NIL, so now you pretty much can pay the best players out of high school to come play for you. So it's like, stop telling me what he didn't have. Stop blaming it on injuries, bro. At the end of the day, bro, Jimbo Fisher has been unable to develop a good, competent quarterback since Jameis Winston. And if you want to use Kellerman, okay. But Jimbo Fisher kind of is a little bit of the reason why Texas A&M season Went the way it did last year. Not even Connor. He was the full reason why it went the way that it did last year. Because going into last year, Texas A&M, according to 247 Sports Team Talent Composite Ranking, had the fourth most talented roster in America. You can say, well, JT, we didn't have Dev. We didn't have this, bro. If you're a good coach, 
You find a way to get it done. So this year, no excuses. All right? If Jimbo Fisher lets Barbara Petrino cook, I think things are going to work out pretty well in Texas a and favor. And with how talented they are, it's like there's not really a single game that you can look on their schedule and say they don't have a chance at winning. Honestly, like I truly, I truthfully believe that they could go in and beat Alabama this season. Like I think that this is the most skeptical I've ever been about Alabama going into a season. Like normally, Alabama, you look at their quarterback position, you kind of already know who the guy's going to be, and you already know that he's going to be pretty good. But this year, you don't really know what the hell you're going to get out of the quarterback position. So for Texas and now, man, like you talk about a team that's kind of being a little bit overlooked. This was a team that prior to last season, everybody always used to gas up and be like, oh man, like Texas and them is going to be a dark horse playoff contender. And now all of a sudden they go five and seven and then people kind of just don't throw them to the woods and forgot about them. I ain't forget about y'all. Y'all, y'all had a down year. You know, Jimbo Fish needed a little bit of that, that humble pie. And even then, we're still waiting to see if he truthfully is going to hand the play calling duties off to Bobby Petrino. But this Texas A&M team, from a talent standpoint, I think they're really good. Their offensive line is one of the best in the SEC. They got a veteran group. They have a lot of guys who are going to be playing this season, who soon will be playing on Sundays. You got a really good group of receivers. You got a good quarterback. Jimbo Fisher on National Signing Day when Connor Wigman had um, signed his letter of attendance, and he was talking about Connor Wigman. He was like, he believed that Connor Wigman was the best quarterback out of that whole entire class. And he wasn't being biased. Like, he truthfully believed that. And I believe him, like, with the money that Texas A&M will be dishing out to these recruits, I'm pretty sure they could have gotten any quarterback they wanted. Most of them. I think Texas A&M is going to bounce back. I mean, if this offense ends up being better under Bobby Petrino, then truthfully, like, what, what game can you look at on Texas a and schedule and say, hey, nah, they're not going to beat that team? I mean, they have one of the most talented rosters in college football. The only thing that has held them back kind of has been Jimbo Fisher and his lackluster offense. So with Barbara Petrino, as long as Barbara Petrino is able to get handed the keys to the Lamborghini, I think Texas a and should be winning seven games minimum, 10, maybe 11 games max. Hell, maybe they could go to the SEC championship. Like, that's how good I believe Texas A&M's team is this year. I really think the only question mark with Texas A&M is going to be the coaching. Are Bobby Petrino and Jimbo Fisher going to get along? Are they going to be able to coexist? I believe they're going to find a way to make it work, all right? I think Texas a and is going to be back in 2023. And I'm not somebody who normally is on the Texas a and bandwagon. Like, I'm normally one of those people that's always telling a and fans, man, y'all boys ain't going to do nothing this year. But I truthfully believe that this could be the season that Texas a and kind of ends up being that team that many people thought they could be for the couple of seasons prior to 2022. So... We're just going to take last season and ball it up and throw it into the trash and act like it didn't happen and look at this Texas A&M team for what they are right now. One of the most talented teams in college football with one of the most experienced offensive coordinators in the game and Bob Petrino, somebody who specializes in being able to get the most out of quarterbacks with a really talented roster Texas A&M, I expect them to bounce back, and I expect them to be a factor in the SEC West, at least when it comes to determining who's going to end up representing that side of the SEC in the conference championship game. This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. If you enjoyed, make sure that you go ahead and leave us with a five-star review. We would greatly appreciate it. Share this episode of the podcast with your friends family members, and acquaintances. And I'll see you guys shortly with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast.